Rick and I arrived back in Concepcion, Chile in late 2016 to begin our 36th year in missions. As we prayed for direction concerning our next church plant, it was as though there was a fog bank before us obscuring our visibility. Just six weeks later, as the sun was setting on a beautiful summer Sunday, Rick suddenly died of a heart attack as we were riding the motorcycle, causing a crash which landed me in the ICU with internal injuries. In the ensuing months, as I healed both physically and emotionally, spending lavish time in God's presence, God asked me to continue as a missionary. I sensed him saying, I've prepared you your whole life for this, even before I met Rick when I was a missionary kid in Indonesia. With the blessing of my three grown sons, I said yes. My church leadership said yes. Assemblies of God World Missions said yes. And the journey began. Questions reverberated in my heart and mind. Where? How? What? Who? Through God's grace, He just led me step by step, gently guiding me. The answers became more clear. Where? Cuenca, Ecuador, where I joined a missionary team connected with Uncion TV. Rick and I had served in Ecuador 30 years before, planting the first Assembly of God Church in Loja Province. How? Relying on God to help me as I've learned to do many things outside of my toolbox, depending heavily on your prayers, grateful for your continued financial support, even in the middle of a pandemic. What and who? God has guided me to mend broken relationships, train, encourage, and empower Ecuadorian pastors, missionaries, and leaders, as well as mentor and train new U.S. missionaries in Latin America. An example is Christian Center of Sinincai. Their building project was stalled for years due to a lack of funds. The church stepped out in faith, raising $35,000. Pastor Julio sold his only vehicle, giving all the money to the project. Sinikai inaugurated their new sanctuary in 2020. Another example are church planters in Chiquintad, Ivan and Julie. The Holy Spirit prompted me to visit them one Sunday afternoon. Later, they told me they were ready to throw in the towel. However, my visit spurred them on. After 40 years in Latin America, God has positioned me to pour into the lives of current and future leaders. I can only look on in awe. Pray with me for more workers. Pray for missionary and Ecuadorian church planters. Pray that I will always hear the voice of our Good Shepherd. And as an obedient sheep, follow. You are my partners, sustaining me as I go. Thank you. I love you too. <laughs> Honestly, we're all in this together. And as long as you're doing what God asks you to do, what you do is every bit as important as what I do. So thank you. Um, yeah, Pastor, thank you for inviting me. Very special to be here. I kind of follow you guys a little bit, you know, see what's going on on Facebook, and it's exciting what the Lord is doing here. Um, so I thought of the word purpose, and, you know, are we living God's purposes? And I looked up the, I love looking up the, you know, definition in the dictionary, and it said this, the Oxford Dictionary said this, the reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. God's purpose, he made us, right? He created us and we exist for God's purposes. <clears throat> and then for us to be able to live in those purposes because he doesn't force his purpose on us. He invites us to live that purpose. So I have to purpose to live in his purposes. I love kind of just doing the little tongue twister, but it's, maybe you'll remember it then, right? But it's that we have to choose. We have to purpose to live in his purposes. And we have many excuses as to why we don't. Or we might just 
not even actually formulate an excuse, but we just ignore it. I love this verse in Acts, Acts 13, 36. It says this about David, King David. It says, certainly David, after serving his own generation according to God's purpose, died, was entombed with his ancestors, and his body suffered corruption. So, you know, just like all of us, he had a life, and then he died, okay? We all are going to be here a certain number of years, and the Lord knows how many that is. But David, they, you know, it could be said about him that he served his generation according to God's purposes. Now, we know David wasn't perfect, and none of us are either. So we, do, we, we listen, we do our best, like I said in my video, to be that obedient sheep and follow that voice. So God put us in this generation. Like it or not, here we are. 2023 and all that that means. But this is our generation. God does not ask us to do something for some generation that's past. And he's not asking us, well, in a sense, we are doing something for the generations that come because as we change our circle of influence, as we share the gospel and people are changed by God's grace, their future generations, our future generations, will be changed also. But what we do, we do now. 2023. So what are God's purposes for my life? What is God's purpose? Well, the primary purpose as Christians is to bring glory to Him. And... Um, I wanted to read something out of the message. I actually brought my phone up this time. So now just be patient with me because I'm not very savvy. Okay, so this is in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 21. Take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. Speaking of the Christian life, okay? I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you, me included, not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses, chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies? That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by with blowing your own horn before God. Everything that we have, right thinking and right living, a clean slate and a fresh start, comes from God by way of Jesus Christ. That's why we have the saying, if you're going to blow a horn, blow a trumpet for God. <laughs> so God calls us to be his children and it's to bring glory to him. And he calls as in other translations, the foolish things of this world, the base things of this world, ordinary people to do extraordinary things. <clears throat> God has called us to the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in a certain sense, every Christian has a calling. Do you feel that? That God has called you to win others, to reconcile others to Christ. Obviously, the Holy Spirit is the one who convinces of sin and draws people to him. But God chose to use us to speak into other people's lives. It says in 1 Peter 2.9 that he's called us to announce the virtues of him who called us out of darkness into his admirable light. So we just talk to the people around us, our circle of influence, our friends, our family, our coworkers, our schoolmates. That's something every Christian does. But I want to go beyond that to talk about the calling of God for ministry, like where you give your whole life to ministry, or maybe a season of your life to ministry. 
As Paul wrote in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, and he wrote it in other places too, he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. He was set apart. That is like a unique calling. Every Christian has the calling to share Jesus. Every Christian has the calling to be light where they are, to love, etc., etc. But this is a special calling to be set apart to be a minister of the gospel. That could be here in the United States, or it could be as a missionary. So I just wanted to share uh, my husband's calling and my calling. Um, we were both children of missionaries. You might think, well, you know, obviously, you just kind of follow the footsteps. And, you know, I suppose that can happen, right? But I'm one of four children, and I'm the only one of the four who received that calling. Um, so it isn't always just a given. So he was living in Argentina and going to school one day. He was 13 years old, and he's walking to school, and he was thinking about probably a football game, a soccer you know, game after, after school or something, and this thought just kind of blows through his mind. You too will be a missionary someday. And he just kind of really, in a sense, ignored it, but he did just stored up in his heart. Like, remember Mary says in Luke that Mary, all these things that happened with baby Jesus and all, she stored them, she guarded them in her heart. So fast forward some years, he's now going to have to go to college. And normally what missionary kids do is they go to the States to go to college. And so his mother, please, please go to Northwest, go to Northwest in Kirkland. And at least one semester. And... You know, he knew he'd probably go more, but he just kind of tortured her. And so he did finally, <laughs> you know, he went. And <clears throat> in that very first semester, <clears throat> he, he sensed once again God calling him to missions. But as he very willingly would share with churches, so I'm not like, you know, saying something terrible and he's going to turn over in his grave. Um, <laughs> uh, he would say, I thought God had made his first mistake when he called me because... I felt like I didn't have anything to offer the Lord. He said, I, I, I couldn't preach. I felt like I couldn't teach because it was so hard for me to learn. He was ADHD. It was just very hard for him. And so he felt like, you know, how, what, what do I have to offer the Lord? So even, even though he struggled with that, he just continued to walk the path of obedience. So that would be like one little tip for you. If you're feeling that nudge, if you're feeling like God's calling you, keep walking in that, in that direction. And the Lord will just continue to help you and show you the way forward. All right, so he did graduate from Northwest. And then, by then, we had gotten married and we went out on our first assignment, which was a one-year assignment. And it was kind of to test the waters to see, can I really do this? Can I really be a missionary? So even though he had said yes, he was still really struggling. So while we were down in Argentina and Paraguay, he finally totally surrendered and said, okay, God, I get it. If this is what you want me to do, I will do it, and you will just have to help me. And the Lord helped him to amazingly. He was a great preacher. He was a good teacher. He loved the people. Like so many times we'd be off you know, doing something, maybe gone to a pastor's meeting or something. And then on the way home, he'd go, oh, let's go visit so-and-so. And I'm like, oh, I'm, so, I'm tired or whatever, you know. But he just loved the people so much. And God used him greatly as a missionary. So I tell you this story because I want you to not push aside what the Lord's speaking to you because you feel like you don't have it. The Lord likes to use people that don't have it because then he is glorified. Remember Gideon? I just read that in my devotions this past week. You know, he mustered a pretty big army and God's like, uh-uh, too big. He whittled it down to 300 against this multinational uh, army. 
and God got the glory, right? We still talk about it today. Um, there were, Rick would say to people when he would talk about his call, he would say, treasure your calling. It is something that's precious. It's precious. Treasure that calling and don't ever walk away from it. So when we were heading to Chile, um, now this was after that one-year assignment, then we were going back, okay? And we had been a youth pastors in Canby, Oregon. Uh, so the church is like sending us off. They're, you know, praying for us and everything. And this man, a, a middle-aged man from the church, one of the deacons came up to Rick crying. And he said, the Lord called me to Chile years ago. And I always had excuses. Not now, Lord. My kids are too little. Not now, Lord. They're in high school. It would be a hard transition. Not now, Lord. Not now, Lord. And he just saw his life going away. Now, it wasn't that he wasn't useful for the Lord. He was a leader in the church. He obviously was useful for the Lord, but he didn't follow God's call. And he had regrets. It was obvious. And he told Rick, I feel like the Lord has taken that call that he gave me and he's placed it on you. But the question is, what would have happened if he had said yes? What things, what churches would have been planted in Chile? What souls would have been saved? What families would have been transformed if he had said yes all those years before? So my call, I was, you know, grew up in a missionary home and I can't say I ever had like a thought like Rick had, um, but every time I would ever hear a missionary you know, like a missionary service or sing a missionary song, I was always very broken. And also, when I got to the States in, uh, for college and started going to a church, and even, even on furlough, I was going to Westminster Assembly up in Seattle, it's like, wow, there's just so many churches everywhere you look, and there's so many pastors, and, you know, there's so much more need on the mission field. So it was just this constant tug. But I would say that the biggest crux for me was when Rick died, because I'd been a missionary already, you know, tons of years, right? But it was always the two of us. It was always kind of like, yeah, I'm called, but it's something, you know, I'm helping Rick. He was the lead pastor, I'm the associate pastor. So when he dies, and now the Lord's saying, you do it, keep going. I had to answer the call again because it was a whole new thing to be a missionary by myself. And for instance, getting up here and talking today, being the, the, the word, the, the preacher, you know, like before Rick did the preaching and I would just come up and say, hi everybody, it's so good to be here. We have three children, Devin, Daniel, David, they were all born on the mission field. I have one grandson, three and a half years old, and I have another one that's going to be born next Sunday, supposedly. So, and then, you know, thank you, love you guys, and I go sit down, and I'm done. So, you know, having to do this, it's a whole new thing for me. So, it was not necessarily super easy to say yes. Uh, my initial, honestly, when I'm laying there in the ICU, um, Okay, what happened was, you know, we're on the motorcycle. He has one of those widow-maker heart attacks, and so we crashed. He had just ridden his motorcycle from Oregon all the way to Chile, other than he had to put the bike on an a airplane from Panama City over to Bogota, Colombia, because you can't drive through the Darien Gap. But he had ridden all that way, and he's ridden motorcycles since he was a teenager, so an excellent motorcyclist. So there was no reason to crash, and you know, I'm laying there in the ICU, well, why did we crash? And um, they did an autopsy the next day, and it's because he'd had a massive heart attack. So I'm just thinking, yeah, I'll go back to Seattle where all my kids live and get a little bilingual job, and you know, this, it, missions is over for me. And the Lord's like, no way. So I had to surrender. I had to surrender and say, Okay, Lord, if you're calling me, you're going to help me. And I have been astounded, honestly. 
people would ask me, well, what are you going to do? And, you know, I wasn't exactly positive what I was going to do, but the Lord has used me in ways I could have never imagined. So just, okay, this is an example, Pastor. The, the general superintendent of Ecuador comes up to me in December and says, could you teach a class for all the candidates who are good, that want to uh, put their name into the hat to be elected to one of the national positions? Superintendent, vice superintendent, secretary, treasurer, uh, whatever the other one's called here in English, vocal. And they, they asked me to teach an ethics class to them. And I'm like, why would they ask me? You know, so he just continually surprises me with favor and opportunities. I'm nobody special. I am just an ordinary person with my own little fears and anxieties and, you know, like stage fright and all those different things. Um, so if God can use me, he can use you. And you will know if the Lord is calling you. It's, it, it's a persistent, uh, he's not going to just say it once and it's like one and done. He's going to keep coming back around. My, my parents had visions. My mom had a vision when she was a preteen of sitting under a tree teaching little brown kids. But that wasn't the only time. When she was in Bible school, the Lord kept asking her, how much she was willing to give up. And the hardest one was, are you willing to go alone? She had to say, yes, I'm willing to go alone. Then she, the Lord gave her my dad, but she had to be willing. So the Lord, you know, he keeps coming back. So don't worry if you've thought something, if you've had a vision, if you had a dream, if a verse in the Bible jumped out at you, if someone spoke a word over you, you know, uh, it's not going to be a one and done. God's going to keep coming back around. And, you know, if you're, if you're in the word, if you're praying, and if you're obedient, he is going to speak to you one way or another about what you're supposed to do, whether it's a full-time ministry or, like Pastor calls it, um, marketplace ministry, where you're in your job or at your school or whatever, what are you supposed to do? He wants to speak. I loved talking to Lavira this morning at the door because she was telling me I missed. Her. Uh oh, is it good? Oh, okay. Um, I missed her testimony this morning during our prayer time. But basically, the Lord asked her to pray for Cruz. Uh, no, Cruz, Cruz. You know, you say it really English-like. I want to say Cruz, um, but anyway. <laughs> and um, so. So she obeyed and she prayed. And so I told her, Lavira, don't worry. God's going to keep asking you to do stuff because it's like, well, I have found somebody who's actually listening to me and not only listening, but doing what I'm asking. So just baby steps, baby steps. Um, okay, let me see. How am I doing? Okay, I'm good. Um, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, if you haven't received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, that is going to be a catalyst as well because Jesus said, okay, now I have to find it. Where did he say it? Oh, okay, now I'm... Um, I should know this by heart, Pastor, sorry. Uh, Acts 1.8, but when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, don't be surprised if some of you are called into full-time ministry. Everybody has talents. And God wants to use a variety of talents in missions, in pastoring. There's so many different kinds of pastors. There are certain basic criteria, like love for the people and things like that, but some have more of a teaching ministry, some have more of a preaching ministry. But God uses our talents. And 
if you are feeling something and you want to, and maybe you're thinking, but, but I'm a carpenter, or I'm an electrician, or I'm a teacher, a school teacher, uh, there is a website of the Assemblies of God that has short-term missions opportunities called Wide Open Missions, all together, wideopenmissions.org where there are opportunities all over the world where you would be working with a career missionary and using your, your God-given talents. So one of the signs of revival is a surge in callings to ministry and missions. So this church is experiencing growth. It's experiencing miracles which is so awesome. If we don't ask and we don't expect, we don't receive. But if you come with expectation, if you ask, you receive. I've been several times to a church in Argentina, Rey de Reyes, Claudio Freyson, that's in revival. And this is definitely true, a surge in callings to ministry and missions. But I want to commend your pastor because I have experienced also where churches are in revival and people are wanting to go. They're wanting to train up. They're wanting to be launched out from a church. And the pastor's like, but, but, but you're our best Sunday school teacher or whatever it might be, you know. And so I, we don't really want to lose you, you know. And that's a very sad thing. Whereas your pastor is like, go for it. If the Lord's calling you. We're with you, and we want to help you do that. The pastor of that church that's in Loja that I mentioned in the video, so it had a picture of us when we were really young in front of a tent. Well, the current pastor was 19 years old when he arrived at that tent two weeks into the tent crusade, and he had no background whatsoever in the Lord, and he accepted Jesus. And within about a year, he was planting his very first church, so like a baby Christian planting his first church. And he has now, that church has planted probably nine churches in diff their, their goal because that was the very first church in an entire province, which would be like a state. It's a smaller country, so, you know, but it's a province with, you know, a population of one or two million or something. So, you know, it's a big area, and it was the only Assembly of God church in the whole province, but his goal is to plant one in every single county seat in that province, and they're well on their way. But he was telling me one day in the car that um, whenever he peels off a leader to go plant a church in such and such a town, and sometimes whole groups of people from the mother church because... It might be in the same city, but in a different, you know, a neighborhood like way up on, a, on the mountain or something. He says, it doesn't seem to matter how many people we take out to launch something else. The Lord brings in more. They always have a space problem. <laughs> they make space and the Lord fills that space. <laughs> so uh, the attitude here at this church is for growth. And, it, and it, you guys will grow and the church is going to grow. So praise the Lord for what he is doing. I'm just so excited for the future of this church and excited for anyone who's listening that's feeling that nudge because from experience, it's a wonderful adventure. I'm not saying it's necessarily easy, but there is nothing like walking in God's purposes. He provides. Remember what it says? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these other things will be added. Like you don't need to worry. If he is speaking and he's asking you to do whatever this thing is that he's asking you to do, he's got your back. He's got you. So it is an adventure to walk with the Lord in his calling. So uh, I don't know if there's anybody here who has... I, I, congratulations, all of you who got baptized. Obviously, the Lord is bringing a lot of people into his kingdom. If there is anyone here who has not made that step of faith to ask Jesus into their lives 
and be the Lord of their lives, I want to just say a prayer with you right now that you can kind of repeat after me. Um, it's not like a magical prayer because unless you actually believe it in your heart, it's just you're just talking, you're just talking. But if you really believe it in your heart, the reason I'm going to say a prayer is just to kind of help you formulate your thoughts. But um, basically, as that one song is like the gospel, <laughs> right? I love that. But, you know, Jesus came and took and died for our sins because we all, it says in the Bible, we deserve to die because of our sins, because that's just the way it is. We don't, you know, we don't make the rules. <laughs> So, but Jesus died in our stead, and he took those sins on himself, and he offers it as a free gift to us, salvation, right? He offers that relationship, that right relationship with God as a free gift. We just have to believe it and accept it, and then we are part of his family, and we are assured eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life, right? So we'll pray that, and then after that, I'm going to open it up for those who are feeling that calling to ministry, be it pastoring, maybe an evangelist, maybe a worship pastor, children's pastor. There's so many different aspects of ministry, missionary. Then we're going to pray for you too. But first of all, I'm just going to pray for those who would want to receive Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your great love for us. That even when we messed up and sinned and rebelled against you, you provided a way back through your son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for being obedient all the way to the cross for us, for love for us, to pay the penalty of our sins. Take it upon yourself. And Jesus, I believe in you. I believe in what you did. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want to be your child. I want to be a part of God's family. So I surrender to you today. And I want to live my life in honor of you, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. So if anyone is... Why don't everybody stand up? If anyone is sensing God's call on their life. I would like you to come forward and we are going to pray for you. It's a step of faith. It's scary. But you know what? If that's what God wants you to do, it's going to be the happiest place you can be. The happiest, the most fulfilling and you're doing what God wants you to do. It's the reason why God has you here in 2023. So is there anyone who would like to come up here? Amen. Amen. I've got goosebumps. They're under my shirt, but they're there. Amen. Wow, this is exciting. You know that in Acts it says that the disciples turned the world upside down? There were 12 of them. Hermiston, Zeal Church, can turn the world upside down. And most of them were pretty ordinary people. You know? He likes to use ordinary people to do the extraordinary. 
Oh, Lord, I thank you so much. Thank you so much for each one of these precious people who are answering your call, Lord. Oh, God, thank you so much. Lord, I pray that you will make it abundantly clear what it is you're calling them to, Lord. Thank you, God. May they take those baby steps and then the giant leaps, Lord, towards what your purposes are. Oh, God, I come against any lie of Satan that would tell them that they can't do it because we can't. We can't do it in our own strength. We can only do it in your strength, Lord. I bless each one, and I ask you, Lord, that in these days to come, you will just continue to speak into their lives and show them the way forward, Lord. I pray that the leaders in this church will be able to come alongside them and encourage them and speak into their lives too, Lord. Oh, God, I pray for each person here in this room, the ones who didn't come forward for this type of calling, Lord, but for our calling as Christians. I pray that there will just be a renewed purpose to reach their circle of influence for you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In your name, amen. Pastor. Just stay right here, those who have come forward. Amen. Praise God. You know, like I said before, this is not something we talk about every Sunday, but it's as Mr. L- Laurel L'Oreal said it's giving our whole life. And you may not know what that's going to look like. And it may just take the initial step. And there are others among us that I know have a call of God in your life as well. It takes, you know, more of this. This is part of the ministry of the church is to identify and to encourage. It's kind of like with when we raise our children. Our job is, is not that because I'm a mechanic, my son's going to be a mechanic but rather, God, show me what my son's gonna be. Show me what my daughter's gonna be and help me as a parent to to encourage that. Uh, Not to, because we as parents, we don't call. In fact, we the church, we don't call, God calls. We only affirm, we acknowledge, and we bless, and we encourage. And so would you do this? Would everybody just raise your hands this morning and and uh, we're going to pray for those who've come forward, but also for all of us, whether it's vocational ministry or marketplace ministry, that every one of us have a call of God. And to not ignore, you know, especially among even our young people, don't let anybody tell you if you feel the call of God, don't let anybody tell you you need to get a real job. I'm telling you the call of God is a full-time job, can be a full-time job. Uh, can be a full-time ministry. And so, Lord, I thank you again, dear God. What a rich word we have just received. And for those who've taken that initial step to say, to give you their yes, to simply say, yes, Lord, I'm here and I'm available. And to anyone in this audience here today, dear God, that is wrestling and saying, Lord, what does that look like? God, we by faith, dear God, say yes. We said yes to you at salvation. We say yes to you when it comes to the giftings of the Holy Spirit. We say yes to you when it comes to our purpose. Whatever that purpose may be, we know, as it was said, that to to walk in your purpose is to be in the best place on planet Earth and to be in the best place in our walk with you. And so, God, we just speak, uh, dear God, life over these who've said yes. And Lord, may, may and if with every step, may our faith continue to grow and mature. Give us eyes that see. Give us ears that hear. Give us a heart that is ready. Dear God, having said yes, dear God, that you give us a whole different perspective on life and the purpose of our life, Lord. And so God, with it, we give you praise in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we give God praise?
Praise God. I want you, for those who see, you know, you see these faces and, and just to be an encouragement. You know, this is the thing about the call of God. The moment you realize it is the moment you're already walking in it. Does that make sense? You know, I'll, I'll tell a story on Sherry. Back in high school, um, she felt the call of God on her life. And uh, that was back in the days when, you know, dress codes were different. And, but she started dressing the part. Wearing, she started wearing, uh, you know, in, in the style of her heroes uh, of the faith, whether they missionaries, pastors, whatever they were. It wasn't just in the dress, but it was in the attitude to say, God, from this moment forward, I acknowledge your call on my life and I'm going to walk in it. She had never been to Bible college, had never taken us, it was it had never taken that step yet, but the moment she realized the call of God was on her life, she began to say, yes, God, okay. And we all should, we all should live that way. Uh, again, whether it's vocational or Market Street, we need to believe that God has called us and commissioned us and given us a purpose. Amen? So when you walk into your job tomorrow morning, just walk like you own the place. You say, God, these people, these people, aren't, these people are part of your kingdom. They just don't know it yet. You know what? These bodies are going to be healed. It just doesn't know it yet. Amen? My family is going to be saved. They just don't know it yet. That's the attitude of an individual walking in the calling and purpose of God. Amen? Amen. Let's worship with everything that's within us today. Miss Laurel is going to be in the lobby to answer more questions and to talk about Ecuador. And uh, I just encourage you to see her on your way out the door today. But before we go, let's worship and bless each other in Jesus' name.